It is, what time is it? Wait, what time is it? It is three quantum o'clock. Welcome to another online quantum technology meeting. Today, atomic clocks and network synchronization. And wait a minute. I see Ericsson, I see Leonardo, I see Aurelia, I see Cole Quanta in the room. This is going to be spectacular. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. On Wednesday, 6th of October, atomic clocks. That's right, we resume our series of quantum technology meetings with the low-hanging fruit that can be harvested from the quantum tree, namely atomic clocks and network synchronization. Every sector across our digital infrastructure requires very precise timing, whether it's at home, on our mobile devices, telecom networks, energy control or broadcast television. One sector in particular has become very reliant on precise time, the high-frequency financial trading, the nearly 6.5 billion shares that will be traded within the next 24 hours all require reference to a precise time. If you are in the atomic clock business, you'd say Business is fine. Just look at the recent contracts that Orolia landed with the European Space Agency and Leonardo to provide atomic clocks for the first 12 satellites of the Galileo second generation system, the so-called G2S. And atomic clocks are beautiful. This is the NIST F2. An atomic clock at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Colorado. It's one of the world's most accurate clocks. It is designed to measure the very specific oscillations of cesium. Inside it, a gas of cesium atoms enters the clock's vacuum chamber. Microwave laser beams push the cesium atoms together into a ball, and the lasers toss the ball up and it falls back down, emitting photons. And a new generation of atomic clocks are on the horizon, using different gases instead of cesium, and even laser light instead of microwaves to divide time into even finer slices. To address the current world challenges in network synchronization, we need the most stable, robust and accurate clock humans have ever made. And the quantum industry has answers lined up, from the metrology institutions PTV in Germany or NPL in the UK, to the space agencies NASA, ESA, their prime stylists Alenia Orolia, and the telecom companies like Ericsson working with EPIC member Viavi in solving the synchronization needs of IoT and 5G, and will go inside the next generation atomic clocks from Call Quanta to know what lasers, optics, and detectors they need. We will be exploring the huge challenges for the industrialization of those atomic clocks, both in the Harash space environments as well as in the volume applications. So tomorrow is already here. Join us on Wednesday, October 6th for a top-level discussion on quantum technologies. What are the short-term prospects for business? We'll have all the right experts in our Zoom room together with the pioneer companies who are ready to champion the challenge. Wow! Wow, and it is indeed now three o'clock, four minutes past three. And you know, when the ball of atoms goes down and you shine the laser to it and you collect the fluorescence, and then with that frequency change, you actually can determine the transition time. That's so beautiful. That physics, physics that gives me goosebumps. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What kind of laser components? What kind of laser technologies? What kind of optics can we do to improve the next generation atomic clocks? This is what the meeting is about. And a person that has worked really hard on this on the last months is my, is my quantum colleague and my quantum partner in crime, Sana Pika. Congratulations <laughs> on the amazing job you had done on the last weeks collecting some of the most important success stories worldwide. That funny enough, 
happen in Europe. So thank you very much for that. Epic keeps growing 750 members, 750 members in optics and photonics. However, our quantum sector is growing extremely high. Quantum is now our number three market after data con telecom and laser-based manufacturing. So I'm really happy to see how our companies are developing quantum applications for many different aspects, academic, but also industry now. Epic, it's an association of 750 companies. We know each company individually really well. And here, just talking on behalf of a fantastic team of people with half of them with PhDs that know the technology as much as possible. And together, we organize events always scouting the end users. Our technology scouting makes us unique. We also provide access to our network, more than 100,000 contacts in the industry. We help you raise capital. We also have the biggest website to find a job in photonics, jobsinphotonics.com. And thanks to Tracy Vanek, we also provide you with exclusive market data to all our members. Today is our first meeting of this season on quantum technologies. Atomic Clocks, on 3rd of November, ion traps, gravitometers, and other quantum sensing applications. And on the 1st of December, the big one, the big one, large scale qubit generation using photonics, ions, and superconductors. That's gonna be so spectacular. And also, we organize, of course, for events in photonics. And next Monday, we had our laser vision correction meeting. That's always a very unique one. But today is all about atomic clocks. Well, first of all, I would like to acknowledge our media partner, Photonics Views. Thank you very much for promoting our event so much. for love. People love to see how we are actually bringing the industry together. Thank you, Photonics Views, for helping us communicate in that. Also, I would like to announce our cooperation with the Quantum Business Network, QBN, because together we are stronger and we want to go far. We need to join hands with the right people in Europe. The Quantum Business Network is going to help us addressing many of the key quantum sectors from the financial all the way to the end users and system integrators that need to integrate the photonic technologies to solve real challenges, real business opportunities with today's quantum technologies. And finally, last but definitely not least, this meeting wouldn't be possible without the support of our sponsors today, Cycle, who deliver quantum clocks, deliver clock and frequency distribution systems based on ultra-fast lasers, which reach femtosecond precision. Their customers include ISA and other research facilities, top research facilities around the world, all the way from Denmark and KT Photonics. The thanks to their fiber laser solutions, they get ultra-stable mode-hole free lasers with extremely narrow line width, high power, and wavelength conversion for tripe atoms, quantum computing, and sensing applications. And last but definitely not least, all the way from Finland, Moduli, they provide semiconductor lasers to do the MV growth all the way to the packaging, testing, and delivering one key already enabled systems to end users. The entire supply chain on a company that this week announced that is traded publicly. But most important, the most important person in this room, actually the most important person in any quantum room is Dr. Sana Pika, quantum expert at Epic. Sana, what's going to happen in the next two hours? Thank you so much, uh, Jose, for this unique, uh, nobody can introduce online technology meeting better than Jose. Uh, today, we, first of all, our speakers, Wow, we have a great speakers from uh, two, uh, two of the biggest metrology institutes uh, um, in, in Europe, PTB and NPL, but also we will look at the commercialized atomic clocks from Cold Quanta and uh, Aurolia and, uh, and CSEM. And of course, uh, we have the giant Ericsson in the room that will speak about uh, uh, synchronization uh, and five, for 5G together with Viapi solutions. But let's see this supply chain that we have today. And uh, you name it already that you saw uh, Leonardo in the room, but I also saw uh, Dodge Telecom and Bridge Telecom in the room. Thank you so much for joining. And Bosch, also uh, they are here. Thank you so much for joining. And we have, uh, we covered the supply chain from the people doing uh, time distribution and synchronization to the lasers and photonic integrated circuit, which is a very growing sector in this, uh, in this field. Uh, and uh, the equipment to the uh, semiconductor manufacturers, to the quantum photonics uh, suppliers. Uh, this is a very complete uh, supply chain and I am looking forward to start this uh, with no, more, no further delay. We should start this meeting and hear from our first speaker. 
Sarah, I went to Photonex last week in Glasgow. I met the people from Colquanta. They showed me the new atomic clock. This size is beautiful, <laughs> really beautiful. <laughs> this light only corresponds to the companies who registered for the meeting today. If you are an Epic member and you missed your logo at this light, it only means that you forgot to register. We will never forget about you. So please don't let it happen again. Always register for the meetings that are relevant to your technology. And also let me remind everyone that this meeting is live streaming in YouTube. So if you're a YouTuber and you're watching from the anonymous location of YouTube, please make sure that you write any question that you have in the chat, I will read it in the room. And if you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, all you have to do is send me an email, jose.fotatepic-asoc.com, and I will make the introduction. And of course, this is also valid for the people here with me in the Zoom room. Please use the chat to connect with each other. The purpose of this meeting is that you get to know each other. This is not a webinar. You are here in a meeting to participate, to actively participate. Whoever joined the meeting today in the Zoom room with the purpose of listening, Go to YouTube right now. Seriously. Here is an active discussion to participate, but also you can use the internal chat and connect with each other as much as possible. It is okay for me to see you typing because I know that because you're doing that, you are connecting with the right companies today. And also I would like to start the meeting right now because 10 minutes was enough for a nice introduction. We need to start and we start strong. We start strong. We go to PTV to the German Metrology Institute, because we want to know from the most important system integrator in the last 20 years in atomic clocks, you can quote me on that, what are their challenges, their today's and tomorrow's challenges for the photonic supply chain. We go to Elena Jordan, one of the key project leaders at PTV. Elena, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining the meeting. Danke, the floor and the attention of everyone goes to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Jose. Okay, I'll start sharing my screen. Can you see my presentation? Uh, let me see, I, crystal clear. So thank you for having me today. My name is Elena Jordan and I'm working with Professor Tanja Milchstaibler at Physikalische Technische, Technische Bundesanstalt in Braunschweig, short PDB. So, right. PDB is located in Braunschweig in Berlin, and we are in the, at the Braunschweig location where the optics department with the time and frequency division is located. Our group is called Quantum Clocks and Complex Systems, and we are working on four different subjects. One part of the group is working on an indium ion clock, which offers, so it will be a multi ion clock with improved signal to noise ratio compared to a single ion clock and thus a shorter averaging time. This clock is up and running and preliminary tests already reached a stability of low in the low 10 to minus 17 region. So another part of the group is working on many body physics with trapped ions. They study symmetry breaking phase transitions transport dynamics and friction phenomena on the single atom level. And the part of the group that I'm in is developing new radio frequency ion traps, so-called Paul traps. Most of our traps are determined for precision spectroscopy and atomic clocks. And our traps are getting more and more compact and scalable for a large number of atoms. And therefore, we are working towards integrated clocks uh, and integrated ion traps with integrated optics. And the for, fourth part of our group is working on the use of facility ion traps within the Quantum Technology Competence Center of PTB. And they provide standardized characterizations of ion traps and also do some technology, technology transfer to industry. As Jose also already mentioned in his introduction, atomic clocks got tremendously better within the last 100 years. And if you look at the clock performance, which I define here as how many seconds does a clock lose per year, you can see that here are the microwave clocks that are currently used for GNSS applications. And uh, down here, we've um, a performance of like losing one second in 10 billion years 
are the optical clocks. So the currently best optical clocks and they can potentially be used for relativistic geodesy. So basically determining the shift in the, so the gravitational redshift, a relativistic effect on a level of 10 centimeters. That means if you compare to clocks, you can determine the height in the Earth's gravitational potential by 10 centimeters. And here in this image, you can see our radio frequency trap that is currently used in our indium clock setup. It reaches a very good temperature stability leading to very small black body radiation shifts. It offers very good micromotion compensation and it is well suitable for multi-ion operation. Here you can see an infrared image in this inset and that shows that the temperature is stable by under one Kelvin, even when the RF is, is on. And on the right-hand side, you can see the optic clock. This was a project that our group was involved in that developed the first demonstrator of a commercial optical clock. The clock reached st stability in the low 10 to minus 17 region. Here's an overview of our current ongoing projects and our project partners. I put in the lower right corner of this the funding agency. So many of our projects are funded by the German Ministry for Education and Research. In the EDR project, we are developing an integrated iron trap made from diamond chips with integrated micro optics. In the EVEX project, we are developing advanced vacuum technologies, in particular, high density electrical and optical ultra, ultra high vacuum features. And the other two projects, the Atik project and the Quantum Valley Lower Saxony project, here they work on quantum computers. And in the Atik project, several um, yeah, demonstrators with, based on different technologies with trapped ions and quantum computers will be built. And in the Quantum Valley Low Saxony, Saxony project, we are developing the optical interface. So an optical interface of poser for the trapped ion quantum computer. In the future, we want to work on a clock on a chip and use the synergies between quantum computing and optical clocks. We plan to develop a compact, robust optical clock and a chip. And our part is developing the ion trap with integrated photonics. For this, we are looking for UHV compatible components in particular for, for example, for fibers and connectors that with that we can connect the optical fibers to chips. I have here in a picture of a trap of ETH Zurich who already did this kind of project. So not for a clock, but for quantum computing. And here you can see that the connection between the fibers and a ion trap. And we are also looking for integrated optical switches and our active components that can go in waveguides. And often we also need UV frequencies to address our ions. And we are also interested in miniaturized single ion detectors for our ion traps that also work in the near UV at just below 400 nanometers wavelength. And similar efforts are also pursued, for example, by Sandia National Labs, sorry, who are working also on a compact um, ion clock with integrated photonics, with waveguides and integrated avalanche photodiodes. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you so much, Elena, for this uh, great uh, uh, talk and for sharing with us. And I would like to keep a little bit the slide sharing with us the, uh, what you're looking for from the uh, UHV compatible components. Can you give here some um, more deta details maybe on the type of fibers that have to be a or what type of Yes, um, so 
we are basically just looking for polarization maintaining um, fibers for wavelengths, for example, for 370 nanometers for ethereum. And the fibers should be coated with, for example, polyamide or some other low outgassing polymer. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe you can also um, give us more information on the integrated uh, photonic uh, uh, circuits that you may be looking for. Is it like a, you would like to develop this on site and you would like the equipment or rather get ready? And um, we have um, industry partners who help us developing those integrated as a service waveguides. And we are, of course, um, also looking for different kinds of in coupling into our trap chips. So um, some of these structures can be developed by our partners. And we, what we are really looking for is some smart connection between fibers and waveguides. It should be very precise to, to couple into waveguides but also vacuum compatible and mm -hmm. convenient to, to put on. Uh, let me start by introducing you to one of our members from the US, uh, Freedom Photonics. Stephen, you have something in mind. Yes, hi, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so this, this problem is interesting. Uh, we see this a lot of trying to be able to connect uh, multiple components together, uh, sort of the, the photonic packaging is, uh, is definitely an issue that we see uh, within this community. Um, so actually, I have a, a slide, I guess I can I can show. Uh, sure. All right. Okay, we see. Okay, great. So uh, just to give a brief overview for those of you who, who, who don't know us, um, we're a small company in Santa Barbara, California. Um, we're Freedom Photonics, so photonics is in our name. Uh, we primarily deal uh, mostly with photonic integrated circuits, uh, both on active platforms where we develop uh, laser technology, semiconductor ampl uh, optical amplifiers, photo detectors. We also uh, deal with um, passive waveguide structures as well. Um, so we also utilize some of our partners uh, here, uh, utilizing silicon nitride or silicon-based uh, photonic devices. Um, but what I wanted to speak to specifically is a new capability that we recently brought online here at, at Freedom Photonics, which is uh, photonic wire bonds. Uh, an example that is shown in the bottom right hand corner here. This is an example of a single mode waveguide that is connected to uh, a laser. This is using a photolithographically defined uh, polymer type waveguide. Um, this can be applied uh, to connecting not only uh, lasers to fibers, but lasers to chips or fibers to chips. Um, this, these uh, uh, waveguides can be formed in three dimensions. Uh, and uh, the unique aspect here is we can connect uh, devices that have very different uh, mode profiles. So this is a, a way to uh, address very high coupling efficiencies. Um, and this is quite promising. We've demonstrated this already. Uh, on an array of lasers to uh, a photonic uh, integrated circuit. This is formed in silicon nitride. So this is an array of um, uh, lasers formed in 3.5 semiconductor uh, connected to a, a PLC, which is then connected to a, a fiber array. Um, so if this is of interest, uh, we'd love to be able to help and see. What, what way uh, if we... does this work for you? Uh, so this works um, across a very broad spectrum. Um, so we can go all the way down to uh, we've tested down to about 700 nanometers, um, even um, lower. Uh, I think once you start getting into more of the visible wavelengths, uh, there is a little bit of absorption loss. However, these are very, very short um, uh, connections. These are less than uh, a millimeter. So the overall insertion loss would be um, fractions of a decibel. Mm -hmm. That sounds really interesting. Fantastic. And you said it's polymer based. Do you know anything about the vacuum outgassing? Is it that's a good question? Um, I I uh, believe it it, it is. Um, although I think that is something we're also testing and, and ensuring that it is indeed vacuum compatible. That sounds great. Yeah, we have also Thomas uh, Thomas from Fraunhofer ISIT. Uh, Thomas, why don't you share with everybody what you have in mind regarding optical vacuum packages? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? So. Yes. Maybe I can share my, my screen. Um, so 
what we are offering is, um, for instance, um, so this uh, aluminum wafer through wires and glass. So um, you, you're using different kinds of glass, like glass or uh, amorphous glass substrates, and um, are developing such um, aluminum electrical feed throughs, but this is not not uh, everything we will provide. So we also provide um, glass silicon composite wafers with different uh, structures between or in, in them. So um, they're almost arbitrary together with our microfabrication techniques. And um, we will provide um, combined substrates. Uh, this is an uh, uh, anodic bonding substrate. So the, the connection is very tight and very robust with the same CTEs. So there is no mismatch. Um, um, in uh, different temperatures. And <clears throat> with that, we can also provide some, some silicon in glass or glass in silicon, and also some maybe some, um, some uh, uh, optical feed throughs. So from, from the outside to the inside of the vacuum. So what have we done so far? So this is, for instance, um, different kinds of shapes of these hermetic um, encapsulations with tilted lids or domic lids or dome-shaped lids or, or similar. And um, these are actually specified down to 10 to minus 8 minibars. So UHV is a research topic and maybe addressed in some, some further project. And um, so these are some uh, application examples. So usually they were developed to encapsulate our micromirror substrates or, or micromirror elements. Um, the 2D micromirrors driven uh, piezoelectrically, for instance. For them, we made these tilted substrates for getting the, the, the reflex out of the projection plane and also some this very high symmetric domic shape, dom dome shaped um, yeah, package. And also, we can include some thin ghetto film technologies at, or the ghetto films. And the, here are some examples. What can yeah. be done? So here are our uh, micro mirror chips, and these mirror chips can be encapsulated here in this um, yeah. in this hermetic package um, with different gases or vacuum down to ten to minus eight. And also, we are developing some miniaturized laser sources, which can also maybe put in or put nearby these packages. So maybe this yeah, is this 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 can be very interesting um, uh, mm -hmm. as well for uh, trapped ions on uh, on chips, uh, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm I'm very happy to have a, a cold quarter in the room, huh? uh, mm -hmm. and that's uh, why we put them uh, just to speak. First, let me thank again Elena. Uh, very insightful. Please stay because you're gonna uh, be uh, asking uh, cold quanta questions and uh, embarrass the US a little bit on on the topic. <laughs> Because I know the best eye traps are built in PGE, right? <laughs> and let's hear uh, from uh, Cold Quanta. Okay, I'm pulling up. Hi, my... Colin. <laughs> Hello. So tell us what, uh, what what you have. Just sharing my screen now. Let me know when you can see it. Yeah, we we see, we, we can. Um... It's coming. I think we will see it in a second. It just takes a here it go. Now you can go to the presenter mode and just uh... Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I would like to start with uh, giving a brief overview of our company as we've uh, changed a lot in recent years. Um, cold Quanta, first of all, as the name suggests, we specialize in cold atom technology. Uh, we are founded in 2007, uh, born out of research out of University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, much of it from uh, Dana Anderson's lab. I've been with the company for about three and a half years now. I started as an optomechanical engineer and I uh, recently moved into product management as we've become more uh, customer focused, make sure that um, the technology that we're developing has uh, commercial applications um, outside of the, uh, the government contract work that we're uh, very used to. Um, in the past few years, or since I've joined about three years ago, we've added about 100 employees. Um, and during this time, we've taken on private investment and reorganized the company into three divisions that you see here. So we have our Hilbert division, and uh, that division is exclusively focused on the quantum computing effort. Uh, and as you mentioned, Sana, um, perhaps uh, I can, we can get somebody to uh, speak at the December meeting. I can put you in touch with the right people. Um, we also have uh, what we call the QRAS or CRAS division, Quantum Research as a Service. Um, 
their mission is to develop breakthrough technology for government and enterprise. Uh, and the, the division that I belong to is the Cold Atom Tech Division. And our mission is to be the leading provider of quantum devices and machines. Um, and so we'll take the, the research that comes out of uh, the quantum research as a service division and commercialize it uh, and get that ready for the marketplace. Um, we have a lot of scientists and engineers on the team with a lot of great experience. Um, we're headquartered in Boulder, Colorado, and we have offices in Madison, Wisconsin, and Oxford, UK. So now I'd like to give you a brief overview of our product families. Um, we offer a wide range of products to create and improve quantum computing, sensing, and lab environments, no matter what your current project may be. Our glass cells are, are exceptionally high up of quality interface between the atomic source and the laser light. Our, our cells are both standalone products and critical components of many other systems that we make, like our MOT systems, our quantum matter machine um, and clocks uh, and other sensors to name a few. Um, MOTs are our specialty. Um, we're, it's really our bread and butter um, and they're a deployable foundation of cold atom quantum systems. We also have trapped ion packages. Um, and this is born out of the uh, logical qubit program uh, where we um, learned to specialize in packaging um, ion traps produced at Sandia National Labs, namely the, um, uh, the, Perg the Peregrine trap and the Phoenix trap. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today are the atomic clocks. And next slide covers this. So our, we're developing next generation clocks. The first clock we'll bring to market is a microwave clock based on CPT. Uh, we're aiming to, uh, to replace the 5071A cesium beam tube standard uh, by delivering superior frequency stability, startup time, and improved swap. Uh, this program is coming along uh, really well in our lab. Um, we do have some preliminary data, um, and perhaps I can share it with, uh, with some people with uh, uh, offline conversations at another date. I'm not going to do that here. Um, we will have an alpha product ready in the first quarter of 2022, a beta product ready in the second quarter, um, and then we'll move that into production um, you know, as quickly as we can. Um, and secondly, we are working on an optical clock um, to compete with uh, you know, the hydrogen maser. And that is about you know, a year out from the microwave clock, or yes, from the microwave clock. And a lot of this effort around the, the, the first clock that we're going to bring to market is driven by the need for GPS quality time in GPS denied environments. And now in terms of what we're offer and what we're looking for and um, you know, what's so great about this format. Um, really looking to have conversations with other critical players in the field in the quantum application space. Um, as we're developing next generation technology solutions, we wanna make sure that we're designing the system as end users really need it to be. Um, so we wanna build relationships with end users, system integrators um, to understand the, the key performance metrics that really make a difference to their to their business or their research work um, to, to ensure that the solutions exceed the requirements and are designed for smooth integration into, into the larger platform. Um, and yeah, that's all I have for right now. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you so much, Colin. For building a supply chain, you are in the right place. And we expect to see called quantum more and more uh, um, uh, epic online technology meetings, hopefully. And uh, uh, thank you again for this very nice talk. So uh, I see that you have an, uh, you expect to build an optical uh, clock uh, that is 20 kilogram uh, or 20 MP, I think, 10 kilogram, uh, about 10 kilogram uh, in weight. What, uh, can you give more details on that? What are the, what, what uh, atoms are you using? What lasers uh, are you using? Uh, yes, so, the, well, so that smaller form factor clock, that'll be the, 
effort after we bring that rack mounted solution to market. So once we once we have that design down and finalized, then we'll focus on smaller form factor, more ruggedized for, for field deployment applications. Um, so if I ask you for a challenge of this sizing down of the optical clocks, uh, so people now go to atoms like calcium to avoid or to avoid the uh, use of uh, dye uh, laser and so on, like use of dye laser all the time. What what other what other challenges do you have to downsize the atomic clocks and have them so commercialized? Certainly, I think you mentioned the, the lasers. Um, that's a big one that that we're working on, and we're looking for new people to partner on um, to figure out how to get that technology uh, miniaturized into such a small package. Um, also, uh, frequency combs, uh, similar similar idea there. Um, and what about programmable photonic integrated circuits? That's what, uh, Yeah, so... Uh, uh, yeah, hi. So I think I can be a bit of a help here. Can I share my screen? <laughs> sure. I hope. So Diego is from uh, Ipronics. They uh, provide the programmable photonic integrated circuit. Can you tell him what you do? Yes. Uh, first of all, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, we at Ipronics have developed, um, let's say, the first programmable photonic chip. So we can really adapt to different realities and different uh, types of business. In your case, from what I understood, and I have to admit that my knowledge in atomic clocks is limited. So what we have is this kind of mesh with Mark Zender interferometers, and we have independent phase and amplitude control. And so we can make, uh, let's say a programmable circuit and we can make different photonic functions like filters, delay lines, or even matrix multiplications. So for instance, in the case of atomic clocks, um, that use optoelectronic oscillators. We have two components, the electronic component and the optical component. You are referring to the optical components and we can, for instance, replace all this part by our chip. So in this case, we would have a laser, a delay line and a photo detector, which is exactly what we can he have here. We have the laser, the photo detector, and we can tune our waveguide mesh to behave as a delay line. And we can even have crazier ideas. For instance, we could make a delay line plus a filter to increase our quality factor. Um, but, and I cannot stress this enough, this is really flexible and really programmable. So you could have even crazier ideas. Um, so if you see a window of opportunity here, we have actually now our beta tester program open and we are looking for different business models to uh, try to show the advantage of our technology. Uh, could I help you in any way, Colin? Fantastic, yeah, I think um, certainly. And the and I see that Dan commented as well in the chat. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, you know, get your contact information and set up a call. Um, so, you know, we can start talking about this in more detail with the, the right people in the room. Um, and I can include our, our physicists and, and engineers. Um, and this is something that I think we'd be very much interested in. Yeah, for sure. I can also include is, our technical team. I okay. think this is the kind of conversation you like, Jose, right? I love the conversation. Sana. I love the conversation. <laughs> but first of all, what I do love is uh, please, as Cubes call Quanta, we're going to build your supply chain right now with the lasers that you need to collect the fluorescence because I want to go to Ipronix. I want to go to Valencia. Ipronix is one of these success stories in the make. They make programmable photonic devices. This is as relevant to photonics as FPGAs were for electronics. They are making processing of light with the photonic integration. I want to go to the first speaker again. I want to go to Elena Jordan from PTB. Uh, in my mind, Elena, uh, the next generation optical switches uh, are gonna demand very ultra high a low insertion loss from the fiber to the optical switch. For that, we do have this platform of photonic integration. And we also have in the room as also Ligen Tech that offers silicon nitrate technology. I have somebody from Ligen Tech in the room, right, Anton? Yeah. Yes. So this is the challenge for Anton, 
for iPronics and of course for anybody who offer packaging as well, like Freedom Photonics. Uh, I believe that we are in a problem with the quantum technologies. Until now we have been seeing 1 dB, 0 0.5 dB of insertion loss for data on telecom. And I don't think Elena Jordan, when she makes the system integration, is going to be happy with that. They are going to demand 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 dB insertion loss. Uh, Ligentech, uh, Anton, is that something that you think is feasible with the different silicon native wave platform that you are doing and the, the mode matching technologies that you are doing? Yeah, I think it's quite a good question. And generally, as you may imagine, it's highly dependent on the wavelengths that you use, because I believe it was mentioned that for all these applications so far, uh, people are interested in blue or even ultraviolet wavelength range. And I have to admit that for the moment, it will be challenging to find a good coupling solution. But I believe there could be quite a good progress because even now for standard SMF fibers at telecom wavelength range, we can already offer very good packaging compatible solutions for couplers, which means that it's close to 0.5 dB and it's a really large mod field diameter of around 10 microns, which means that, you, that your alignment tolerance is very high. So I believe step by step, we can also go uh, closer to visible and blue wavelength range, but I have to admit that it's not yet there. We Elena, not yet offer it. Elena, the platform of silicon nitrate of Ligentech is already used by Sanadu to make programmable photonic integrated devices, and it's the lowest loss platform that there is available. And actually, Ligentech just have a, an agreement with XFab, and they offer with one of the key semiconductor manufacturers, they offer 200 millimeter wafer in ultra high volume production from January. So, Elena, I really want this technology to be the one that offers the optical switches for uh, for PTV. This has to happen after this meeting. So we need to make that introduction. I want to go to, back to Steven from Freedom Photonics. Quick question, Steven, what is the lowest, the lowest insertion loss you can do fiber to chip on, let's say silicon nitrate or silicon photonics? So I think so far what has been demonstrated using these photonic wire bonds has been a uh, sub one decimal, I think. The best data that we've shown so far has been about a half dB. Now, admittedly, this is uh, more at telecommunication wavelengths. So we're talking uh, about 1550, 1310 nanometers. And as already has been mentioned, as we get down to uh, more visible wavelengths or UV, uh, the losses uh, definitely do increase. So it, it is definitely a challenge right now that does need to be addressed. Very good. I yep. think there, there is, is a key thing, Elena. There is a lot of technologies in Europe that can do what he said, photonic wire bonding. This is two photon polymerization and actually it's printing micro optics that go from the fiber to the chip. We have uh, in Karlsruhe, we have Vanguard Photonics, we have also Nanoscribe, we also have multi photon optics recently acquired by Heidelberg Instruments. We need to make that connection, Elena. We're going to make the introduction for that. This is the solution that you need for the low insertion losses. And uh, when it comes to the optical switches, uh, Ipronics, uh, back to you, Diego, what you can do basically is to make a, a, a generic chip that can actually make any, any function, including, of course, doing optical switching, correct, Diego? That's correct. I think there is clear room for a very nice project here, and I really want it to happen. So offline, we want to make this introduction, and we want to have this round table, because this is a very clear very clear challenge by Elena, and we are going to make a very nice room for cooperation. I would like to invite to the room also CSEM, who provides the robust packaging solution that we need for the uh, for the different applications that we are targeting, because Elena didn't say which application he is, but I know she's pointing at the stars, and on that, uh, Jax uh, knows very well what I'm talking about, correct? Yes, sure. We're going to come to you later, Jax, but this is what we want to, this is the purpose of this meeting. Back to the second speaker. Back to, I want to go back um, to the technologies needed for cold quanta. And there, uh, there is a couple of questions for you. The first one is coming all the way from the UK Metrology Center, MPL. Dan, welcome to the meeting. You are the star today. What's on your mind? All right. Is this my slot for the presentation then? No, you have to ask something because you ask in the chat. I will give you that. Sorry. All right, I got gotcha. you. I was confused there. So um, it was more of a comment, really, but it just really struck a chord. So the, the on the left-hand side is 5071 and, and Mazers. 
passing on to the right, so that's sort of called quanta, was uh, in you know previous applies to all the bits of the supply chain, but really important for us to, to move beyond those because at the moment we're we're actively building a time scale and we're having to use those technologies because they're the really the only proven commercially available suitable ones there are. There's just a huge need for um, partly the really high accuracy end to realize national time scale. But then uh, again, I'll mention this in my talk, um, the, the whole entire ecosystem of time delivery, time transfer, frequency transfer, um, there's huge potential for you know big markets to open up that don't exist at the moment, driven by this need for things like GNSS independence. So that requires a lot of ground-based infrastructure. So again, a bit more of a comment, but uh, uh, you know, very critical for the future to get to the next generation going optical frequencies. Then I'm going to come to you later. I'm going to go now back to Colquanta. So Colin, first we get the atoms, we put them together in a bowl, and for that we use atom cooling technologies. What I have seen right now from, from, from you is that you want to miniaturize as much as possible that module for atom cooling. Uh, you said that laser is one of the challenges. Could you comment what is the main challenge of that laser? Are you looking for a specific wavelength, size, or power? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Toxica to the discussion right now. I have to. Stefan yeah. is Stefan is shaking. Stefan Spaller from Toxica is shaking. He gets goosebumps. Tell us, Colin, what is the challenge there? The size and power. Um, you know, traditionally the the laser systems that we're using in the laboratory, um, you know, take up quite a bit of volume, um, and you know, we want to help help to push the push the envelope on advancing laser technology um, in order to make things smaller, lighter, um, more field deployable. Um, so, you know, potentially photonically integrated circuits, um, as was mentioned, um, and also just, you know, smaller uh, laser modules. We have uh, Stefan from Toptica. Three processes. The first one, we want the atom cooling. The second one, the laser to raise the atom. And the third one, the laser to excite the fluorescence. I know you have been thinking about the three different challenges of cold quanta. What is the key solution here? What is, you think, the, the, the challenge that together cold quanta and Toptica can work on? Yeah, I mean, the, the miniaturization um, at the same time having a high power, that, that's definitely a challenge. Um, um, and that's certainly a trade-off that we should discuss. Um, Colin, I, I, don't, I think we have not been in personal contact so far. So I also suggest let's have an offline discussion on, on what we can do for you. I mean, we, we have been working on, um, on integrating lasers in, in rack systems. Um, so that's like a, a first step, but obviously we wanna move forward in, in you know, having compact laser setups overall and provide um, lasers via fiber, coupling them to, to your setup. And, and yes, so what's, I, I think what's important is really discussing this trade-off between power and, and size. Yeah, absolutely agree. Well, it is, it's nice to meet you. Uh, I will um, post my uh, contact information in, in the chat. Um, seems like I'll get... Uh, Colin, let me tell you one thing, because I really, I, Stefan is, is a very nice person, but I can tell you one thing that, that they have done. This, I don't know, you have visited this. I have, and it's amazing. This is from PTV. It's the Interview Ion Clock they have there. And this is the secret of the sauce. They have worked with them, providing the a specific wavelength on 467 nanometer. And now this wavelength in the 400 these nanometers Thanks to the work of Toptica in frequency doubling, they can actually provide very miniaturized, very miniaturized solutions. That is exactly what you look for. And this is the key challenge. These are the wavelengths between the 400 and 500 nanometers that today, thanks to the amazing work of laser companies here, they can actually provide something that is affordable in cost and size calling. And this is something that we need to make happen. Right, Stefan? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, see, I send my CV to Toptica later. <laughs> uh, and then we go to the third presentation today. And this is one that you all have been waiting for. To have a meeting on atomic clocks, we need to have the key company in optical networking in the European industry. 
So we brought Eric song. Thank you very much, Stefano Ruffini, expert on network synchronization from Ericsson to share the right challenges to the industry so we can make amazing epic things happening, making epic business for Ericsson. Stefano, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jose. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. And go slideshow mode so we can also see the presentation, Gorilla Glass Clear. Okay. So very good. Yes, I, I'll give a a perspective from the user of uh, all of these technologies. <laughs> and um, it, it's about uh, like, uh, why synchronization is important in telecom. Uh, and I am focusing on 5G. Uh, just a few seconds on Ericsson. Uh, I think is a probably well-known company. It has a long history in telecom since the late 1800, <laughs> over the centuries. And uh, probably is uh, mainly known uh, uh, as being one of the uh, uh, main uh, uh, contributors in the evolution of the mobile uh, technologies uh, from the very start uh, in the 80s uh, uh, towards uh, the, the 5G, uh, that is the latest uh, technology in the field. And um, it's a company that is uh, present uh, worldwide. Uh, as you can see, essentially, uh, it has to follow any possible standard, any possible customer need. A large company, more than 100,000 employees. And um, there are a number of uh, uh, platforms that Ericsson is active on uh, to support a variety of applications, uh, verticals, uh, as you can see, the different use cases on the top that are uh, can be connected via wireless. Uh, and in, in the terms of the infrastructures, uh, uh, I would highlight as an important factors that are being considered in the development of the platforms, uh, uh, secure, uh, uh, let's say, secure networks, uh, data-driven uh, orchestration, uh, and sustainability. I think in a way, all of these factors can be important also in the optical technologies. And uh, moving into the technical part, uh, so why synchronization and in particular time synchronization is important in 5G? And the one main reason is the, why the use, especially in 5G, of the time division duplex uh, type of uh, radio technology. Essentially, in brief, uh, that uh, we, we have the radio signal that is structured into time slots, uh, where some of the time slots uh, can send data in downlink towards the uh, user equipment and other time slot in uplink. So what can happen is that the uh, neighbor base stations, if they are not well aligned in time, uh, could uh, create interference. In practice, if uh, one of the base stations switch, switches from downlink to uplink while the neighbor base station is still uh, in downlink mode, uh, 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 there can be obviously some interferences. And the standards have been working at defining some uh, uh, target requirement, target tolerance in terms of time alignment. Uh, and the typical requirement is uh, to have uh, uh, an absolute uh, time reference within one microsecond at the input of the base station. In addition to that, in order to have a common uh, standard uh, uh, between uh, network operators, uh, there is also the need uh, to, to have a, a standard traceability for the time. That means having a, a UTC uh, traceability. And this uh, is important because in this way, every network operator can uh, make sure that the radio frame on the, that is delivered by the base station uh, is aligned with the standard uh, definition of the second. And, uh, uh, Let's move to the, there is another important reason why time synchronization is important in mobile networks. There are some functions like carrier aggregation or dual connectivity where uh, the user equipment uh, uh, must, uh, con must be connected to more than one base station. So it, it has to be able to combine signals coming from different uh, uh, radio base stations. And uh, there is uh, some uh, level of tolerance that is accepted by the user equipment in terms of a disalignment of the arrival time of the radio frames. Obviously, the, the arrival time depends 
on several factors like the distance, the propagation delay between the user equipment and the antenna, but also on the uh, time synchronization of the antennas. Also in this case, there are some requirements that have been defined by 3GPP, in particular, in terms of a relative time error, uh, time alignment error is the term that is used in 3GPP, and typically three microseconds between uh, as a relative time error uh, is acceptable, but in case of collocated antennas, uh, the more stringent requirements uh, can apply uh, down to 65 nanoseconds. So uh, all of this, uh, how can we can be achieved? Uh, as you can see from this picture on the right, uh, that, that's a typical uh, setup for the synchron how to distribute synchronization towards the, the radio base stations. Uh, this is the Ericsson view, but I, I would say is uh, more or less uh, a common, let's say, view from most of the industry. Essentially, we need uh, somewhere a GNSS reference. And the reason is uh, what I mentioned before, that there is a need to have a, a standard definition of the time. So GNSS is a, a convenient way to have access to a common time reference. This reference could either be uh, uh, remotely deployed, uh, and then uh, uh, from these uh, synchronization masters, the time reference is delivered via uh, precision time protocol, the IEEE 1588, towards the access. Or uh, obviously, we can also have uh, deployed the GNSS receivers close to the antennas. Uh, finally, it is also possible to uh, uh, deliver a reference timing signal over the radio interface. Uh, between the neighbor uh, base stations. And it's, it's important to have a combination of all of these technologies. And the reason is uh, uh, that uh, the reason is that the GNSS itself uh, sometimes can be considered a bit uh, uh, vulnerable. It is, uh, can be subject to jamming, uh, spoofing. Uh, so it is al always important to have some backup uh, that can address uh, these issues. And uh, in all of these, uh, let's say, range of solutions, I would say the atomic clock technology is, a, is an important uh, building block. Uh, the traditional uh, technologies based on cesium beam clocks uh, uh, that have been used actually in telecom uh, over the last uh, 40 years. Uh, the latest uh, standard that uh, you can find uh, defining the performance of these clocks uh, is the in IITT G.811.1. That can guarantee 10 to minus 12 uh, uh, frequency accuracy. Uh, you can see it's much uh, 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 below what you can uh, achieve in the lab. I think we have heard uh, 10 to minus 17. But obviously, in a, in a commercial deployment, uh, uh, it's important to have uh, something that is feasible and uh, affordable. And this is actually suitable for the telecom applications. So this type of clock uh, can be uh, uh, located, uh, deployed in the uh, central locations combined with GNSS. Uh, and together can provide also some uh, robustness in case of a temporary loss of GNSS. You can find, for instance, the ITT G.8272.1 that is uh, called the primary reference time clock, enhanced primary reference time clock that uh, is targeting 100 nanosecond accuracy over a couple of weeks after the loss of GNSS. Well, obviously GNSS itself, uh, that is the basis of everything here is based on atomic clocks. Uh, uh, so as you can see, the, the atomic clock technology is, is uh, fundamental for the telecom to, to work. I think this is what, what I wanted to say. So I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Grazie mille Stefano for this. I, I, like you, I'm a big fan of standards when they actually match needs from the industry. And this is one of the things that I'm very excited when I see how, how uh, Ericsson is developing this standard. Could you mention some of the companies that you are working on this standardization activity with? Well, uh, standards, I'm actually uh, very active in ITT as an example. I'm at the Rapporteur of question 13 in Group 15 that is uh, uh, developing uh, recommendations on the synchronization. And uh, in this group, uh, there are actually companies from, um, I would say, users uh, and vendors of clock. So there are several network operators attending and very active 
Uh, I can mention a few like Deutsche Telekom that I see is also present <laughs> today, uh, British Telecom, uh, AT&T, NTT from Japan, China Mobile. There are from everywhere companies uh, of network operators. And then of course there are all the uh, clock vendors uh, and system vendors. Uh, telecom vendors, of course, like uh, in addition to Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, others, uh, and clock vendors, I would say all, all the major uh, clock vendors, I, I don't know, from the US and Europe. Uh, I, I, I saw that you do have uh, uh, lots of people from, from uh, different companies like ID Quantic also connected there and that there is uh, Adva as well, very active on, the, yes. on this network. Uh, the question here is cesium. Is cesium the, the, the atomic gas the, of the future in your mind? Are there discussions about using other atoms? Uh, so cesium uh, works very well. Uh, as I mentioned, 10 to minus 12 is the target today. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I know that there are other technologies, optical clocks that are being, uh, let's say, uh, uh, actually also uh, not, not only in the research, <laughs> but also in the uh, uh, commercial availability. Uh, for this type of applications currently, maybe what I can mention there are other type of atomic clocks like rubidium. Obviously the accuracy is a bit lower in that case mm -hmm. that is sometimes uh, promoted. Uh, but I, I would say cesium is, is the main one. Cesium is the main one. So rubidium and interbium, for you, they are in a, different, in a different kind of step. I have three people who want to talk to you. The first one is coming all the way from Switzerland. And that's a key company in the center, CSEM, Jax Hessler. Thank you very much for joining today. What's on your mind? Thanks, Jose. So my question is, so in, in the network you presented, uh, uh, you have this uh, cesium primary clock uh, that gives the, the time scale. But do you see uh, a potential for in this network for chip scale or miniature atomic clock helping to, to synchronize perhaps the, the receivers? I think it's a good question. Um, obviously, if you have a, a, a small <laughs> clock uh, with, with low power consumption and affordable price, you could uh, uh, place those clocks uh, closer to the access. So it's always a matter of uh, trade-off, let's say, uh, between uh, cost uh, and uh, power consumption and uh, accuracy you need. What, what I, so you need so the, what, what I would like to know is what are the requirements what, what would you expect in terms of power consumption costs and stability for such clocks well stability I uh, as I mentioned if you have a, a 10 to minus 12 uh, at the axis in the axis uh, uh, probably you have a uh, possibility for uh, more flexibility in the network design so uh, but 10 to the minus 12 is your primary clock. So you, you would perhaps need less than uh, at, at the end point, no? At the end point, uh, obviously, you, you need uh, uh, always somewhere a good reference. So uh, your question is probably in terms of uh, holdover. I mean, yeah. if I lose the, the main reference, uh, would be useful to have a, a miniaturized atomic clock. <laughs> Uh, that can provide uh, some, uh, let's say, maybe a few days holdover. Uh, I, I, I want to just warn that uh, for these applications, uh, the, the cost factor is very important. Sure. Because it's, uh, uh, I mean, here we are uh, uh, talking of hundreds of thousands of base stations in a network. And, uh, and therefore, the cost uh, power consumption is, is critical. I, I'm happy, let's say, if you want to have, a, let's say, <laughs> more details, we can have an offline discussion, but I... Furthermore, I furthermore, and I really want you to have that offline discussion. I would like to participate as well. But I also have uh, from Doptica, Stefan, with something interesting on his mind. Stefan, tell us what room for cooperation is here. Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, you mentioned the 10 to the minus 12, which is like the standard now for 5G as a requirement in clock accuracy, right? And, and my question is, I mean, we talked about much higher precision clocks earlier, optical clocks, 
And my question is, is the use case coming along with, for those higher precision optical flocks coming along, for instance, with 6G? So do you see this on the horizon? Okay, that's a, a $1 million question. I, I mean, there are already discussions on 6G. And uh, uh, the point is, uh, one, one factor is uh, you might use higher uh, frequencies uh, on the spectrum, uh, which uh, may have an, an impact on synchronization. Okay, so uh, those three microseconds I, I mentioned before, uh, in, let me go back to the slide. Yeah, this one microsecond, in theory, you, you might want to, to see this, uh, let's say, scalable <laughs> with the uh, new generation of uh, frequencies that are used. However, th this is a bit uh, a complicated discussion because here you see what we want to solve is the, the interference uh, between uh, uh, nearby radio base stations. But then the question, uh, when we are going to use, like in 6G, uh, let's say, uh, higher uh, frequencies, like in the hundreds of uh, gigahertz. W what is the, the actual uh, range of the radio signal uh, uh, that is used? Uh, because if, if, if the deployment uh, uh, implies isolated uh, cells, let's say, then probably there is not uh, an issue in terms of interference. And, and perhaps in that case, we don't need to, to meet this type of, uh, of requirements. So uh, it's, it's still an ongoing discussion. I want to bring uh, to the discussion Helmut from Deutsche Telekom. Helmut Imlau, thank you very much for joining the meeting. What's on your mind on this? Hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear. I switch on your camera because I also want to see you. No, it doesn't, doesn't work right now. Oh, so. That's okay. Uh, so in, in general, can you, you can see uh, the more accurate uh, synchronization could uh, lead to the better spectrum efficiency, but this all has to be standardized due to the interworking between different uh, uh, networks. And so currently in 3, 3GPP standardization, I do not see a tendency at all to go in the direction of stronger synchronization. And this is related to the experience of the companies, to the, the effort of synchronization. I want to address one thing here. I don't believe, and kill me right now, please. The three microseconds is such a big challenge. Stefano, what is, what is the challenge here? I also want to bring to the discussion to, to clarify that question even better because we have uh, Dan Bill from MPL who perhaps is on my, in the same mindset as I am or maybe not, but Dan, can you tell us what's on your mind? Because I want Stefano to, to clarify this a bit more. Dan from MPL, what's on your mind? Yeah, so my question, a little bit related to that. So yeah, I think we can all instinctively know that 6G is going to require much more performance yes. and they want to be able to do uh, positioning, you know, insanely high level positioning, uh, you know, use it as a mini GPS system. So, but part of my question, even if you look at that uh, graph here, you mentioned GNSS vulnerability, you've got what four, let's say four little insertion points listed where GNSS signals come into your network. So is the next really big challenge performance or is it actually resilience? It might be both, but in your mind, what's the, the really difficult next bit? Is it just a few more ticks on a clock or, or is it actually the resilience? Well, that, that's a very good question. Resilience, maybe I, I, I briefly mentioned, is one uh, big issue uh, because a GNSS signal is, uh, let's say, open to, uh, let's say, attack. And uh, it is weak, uh, let's say, as a signal coming from uh, far <laughs> satellites. So this is why you, you need uh, uh, to, to have uh, multiple places where you inject the timing reference. And uh, possibly, uh, like in ITT, there is a, a, a work item uh, to combine GNSS with atomic clocks uh, placed in the, in the central part of the, of the network. Uh, it's called the coherent uh, PRTC type of network. So that uh, even, during, even if the, the, the GNSS disappear totally, 
you you should be able for uh, let's say quite a long period uh, i don't remember exactly but we are talking of uh, weeks uh, months to guarantee let's say performance so yes resilience is, is a big issue uh, one microcycle may look uh, let's say uh, a, a large number today with the technology that we are discussing but uh, when you look at the reality um, how when, when a telecom network operator has to build the network is not so uh, clean and, and straightforward you you have a if you use a timing protocol such as ptp between the master and the and the end uh, clock uh, any uh, any any asymmetry in the network uh, will impact the precision because the timing protocols uh, are uh, based on round trip measurements of the delay so and and the fundamental assumption is that the channel is uh, symmetric but in reality when you build the telecom networks there are uh, uh, multiple sources of asymmetry from anything even from the lambdas that you are using in optical uh, transmissions uh, so the, the, there are issues it's not always straightforward for an operator to uh, deliver one microsecond and uh, now if if you want to go to 100 nanoseconds or uh, even uh, higher accuracy yeah. probably there would be even more issues <laughs> for the network operators uh, which i mean you can solve technically you can solve everything if you like you can build the networks that can deliver one nanosecond uh, or, there less. Is the, or less yes yeah, there are the the, the famous white rabbit uh, uh, indeed uh, so <laughs> in my mind <laughs> you 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 can do whatever you like uh, with technology more or less the the, the point is that uh, everything must be let's say you you have to find a good trade off okay between what you need and the cost for building and maintaining and operating uh, a network so building a network that delivers 10 nanoseconds by the way when you when you talk of 1 nanosecond is not an absolute time it's always a relative time. Okay, Stefano, so. this is a great discussion, but we need to complete the circle. And for that, I need to bring to the table one of your partners in crime here. We need to bring the AVI solution working with you on the IoT and 5G networks. And we also want to bring to a discussion Orolia. And of course, I have Roberto Leonardo as well waiting to intervene. But I want to go now to the AVI. And the reason why I want to talk to you, because we just talked about the challenge. And now we're going to talk how the photonics layer can solve it. And for this, one of our key EPIC members on this sector is the company, the worldwide success story we have been represented today by Dave Fenstermaker. Thank you very much for being with us. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to the beautiful purple logo company of Viavi. Thank you, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm standing in today for my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Reza Vahizagami. He could not attend, so he asked me to to jump in. So, Dave, don't be um, shy. Can you switch on your camera? I, uh, I'm in the similar situation as uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Imlau. I, I, my camera doesn't work on my system at the moment. So, Please I apologize for that. Um, okay. So, um, uh, I work for Viavi Solutions and I'm going to talk about network synchronization uh, test applications. So, as uh, uh, um, Stefano was talking about, you know, the the, the networks themselves. Uh, our company uh, builds um, field test products that help uh, operators uh, validate that the that the equipment that's installed in the field is operating um, correctly. I want to introduce, you know, the overall topic of what's driving the next generation synchronous networks. I think um, uh, Ericsson just presented that. Um, how atomic clocks are necessary in field portable sync testers. We'll look at the time alignment error and time error definitions. I think uh, we've already heard a little bit about that, so um, that we'll go th quickly through that. And then some of the challenges um, that is, you know, in developing portable field test equipment uh, uh, for, for use uh, by field technicians and contractors to turn up, install, and maintain uh, these networks. So as we already heard, uh, the advanced services, uh, 5G and LTE advanced, uh, uh, introduced new challenges. Um, those specs uh, are 36104 and 38104 by, from uh, 3GPP. 
uh, time alignment error is, is definitely the key um, uh, metric here that, that's of interest. And then depending on the application itself, um, whether it's um, MIMO, uh, that, that requires very uh, precise timing, as we'll see. Uh, that's in category A+. Plus. And then as you get down to categories uh, C, uh, for the applications like TDD, the, the timing requirements are, um, are, re are reduced. So uh, here's sort of a, uh, a definition of time alignment error. Um, it, it's, it's basically the, the, the time difference um, uh, between the precision reference time clock and the time delivered by at the antenna or the time represented at the antenna interface. That's the absolute um, uh, time alignment error. And then the relative error, error is, is Erickson was saying, is the difference between um, for example, two antennas in a in a in a co-located or cluster location. So, um, and then here's some of the specs that we're already we already looked at some, um, um, and category A plus and category C, um, and the the ORAN, uh, which is one of the um, uh, ways of delivering um, uh, the five G services. Um, specifies the, um, the, the the mechanism for delivering time across the transport network is 1588 or PTP, and they have lim limits uh, for time error. And um, those are again, are absolute and relative. The challenge is, is that uh, there's some time error allowed for in the radio component themselves. And so the time error that's sort of being measured by uh, field instruments uh, is is actually um, the time error of the network, and then so you get requirements that are um, even below this. Um, so here's an example of a tester um, in various locations of the front hall network. Uh, you, you could be required to measure uh, time accuracy uh, or time error at the grandmaster or uh, at various uh, location points throughout the network. Um, boundary clocks and at the at the endpoints. The ITU specifies in these G.827X documents, the, the, the constant time error, the dynamic time error, all these are different uh, error components. And the, the, the bottom line is, is that the, the, the testers have to be able to be able to measure these in the nanosecond range um, and, and which can be challenging in, in field equipment. So the, the, the field equipment uh, needs to be able to um, uh, uh, be synchronized to GNSS um, so, that, so that it has the com concept of absolute time. Um, and the challenge is, is that um, many of the test access points um, that, I, that I mentioned um, are inside of buildings or in shelters or places that have no uh, access to GNSS signals. And therefore, that brings up the concept of holdover, where a technician is, goes outside the building, um, they, they connect up their antennas, they synchronize their test set, if you will, to, to time, um, and they, uh, they, they need to do that. And then, um, and then they have to go back down inside the building where there's no GNSX signals, and they need to make these measurements, and they need to make these measurements. And there's always time to set up the equipment, to get connectivity to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the access point. And, and, and so all that time, um, you have no longer access to the GNSS signals, so you need a highly stable oscillator uh, inside the, the, the equipment. The equipment itself is a handheld portable tester. Um, it needs to you know, have be relatively low cost, uh, um, relatively um, uh, small, uh, handhelds, kind of uh, lunchbox style uh, size equipment, because field technicians need to carry this equipment everywhere with them. And, um, and, and then these, signal, th these measurement devices provide the time reference signals um, that are needed to make, to make these measurements. So the key thing here is um, we need to be able to have a highly stable oscillator coupled with the GNSS receiver uh, inside the product itself to be able to um, make these PTP time error measurements. Um, so, I just want to kind of wrap up some some of the challenges that we've got here as far as a, a, a field deployment environment. 
uh, for these 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 uh, testers is that you know technicians are carrying these 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 uh, testers and they're going to go between indoor and outdoor settings uh, there's temperature changes there's vibration there's uh, movement um, knocks in the knocks as they carry it through the building or in, in their car um, there's magnetic changes uh, that all that affect the underlying um, oscillator uh, uh, stability if you will and um, so that that introduces error in the measurement and when you're trying to measure things that are down in the tens of nanoseconds um all of a sudden just carrying the box from point a to point b setting it up and waiting that amount of time all of a sudden your reference has drifted um you know 30 40 nanoseconds and you're you're already outside the the limit of what the equipment at that location is supposed to be um uh uh, uh, measured to. So that's some of the challenges that we got. Um, the, the other things are like when you go outside of a, of a building and you need to be able to make measurements uh, or synchronize your equipment to GNSS. If you're in an urban Canyon location, there's multi-path things like that going on from GNSS. And so now all of a sudden you, your, your concept of having time uh, is, has some error component because of GNSS multipath in urban canyon locations. Um, so that's some of the, the challenges that we have in the field tester environment. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing kind of, uh, I'm looking forward to, um, you know, the next generation of uh, uh, atomic clocks that are smaller, uh, more low power, or less, less power, excuse me, uh, lower cost, obviously, um, and uh, can hold up under, you know, environmental, uh, multiple environmental variations and still be able to have accuracies, uh, stabilities in the range of, you know, low uh, 1e to the minus 12 kind of range for um, um, hours. That's kind of the, the, the nirvana for, for us. Thank you very much, sir. Sarah, sorry. go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to thank him for this great talk. And uh, these challenges are shared uh, by clocks that are on field and also the clocks in the lab, for sure. Uh, can you be maybe more uh, specific on the, uh, uh, the temperature changes that you can tolerate uh, or the mechanical or the... Uh, yeah, so, so that, yeah, yeah, I mean, so the, the, the you have to env envision uh, a technician going from potentially taking his test set from uh, maybe a central location um, and then uh, uh, putting it in his car or, or van driving. Uh, so these are kind of what you would expect a user to be going through in a normal sort of a, a transport field technician. So temperature changes of 15, 20 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, um, you know, in a relatively short period of time. Um, and then mechanical and uh, stress due to transporting it would be something similar to, you know, carrying your groceries or carrying, you know, um, carrying equipment from a point A to point B. So, so I think, you know, Erickson was talking about, you know, in their environment, it's, it's, you know, you're in a stable temperature controlled room or uh, uh, possibly not, because you could have equipment at the cell site, at, at, which would be, um, you know, also uh, subject to temperature variations. But they may have cooling facilities or heating facilities or whatever to try to maintain the temperature. This is a little bit more uncontrolled from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. it's, it's good that we have uh, um, Aurelia and uh, Ceci and we talk. Let's see if their clock can. Uh, um be able to overcome these challenges. Uh, maybe Elena, you can comment because I know we have a transportable clock um, at PTB that was tested for this kind of environment. How far is that project going? Okay, um, yeah, we have some portable clock at PTB and that one is a little bit larger than what you described. It fits into the trail of a car and can be driven around, but it's quite far from being handheld in lunch right. size clock. Right. And it's also has much higher stability than you require. So it has a also 10 to minus 17 fractional frequency stability. Very interesting. That's, Thank you. 
Yeah, that's not it, it, that might be good for an operator to have one of those uh, to do their, you know, master troubleshooting or something like that. But yeah. outfitting, you know, hundreds or, or uh, of, of field technicians with something like that would, would not obviously work. So, um, yep. We actually have a, a question from uh, CSE and uh, maybe, uh, Jack, you can uh, ask directly. And, uh, um, yeah, the question was the same than I asked before. Let's say you you said that you are looking or you are using a highly stable clock uh, oscillator in your handheld device. So what are you using for the time being? Yeah, at the moment, it's it, what what seems to fit the the um, the, uh, the 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 the. The, the, the price and size and, and power uh, is, is a rubidium based uh, miniature atomic clock type of solution. Um, we looked at the chip scale at one point um, and it, it fell short in a couple areas. Um, uh, so right at the moment, that's where we're at uh, with, with the technology that's in, in, in boxes that, uh, uh, and testers that I've seen. Okay, so I'd be quite interested to know where they failed. Mm -hmm. uh, I could I can take I, I believe it was in the um, uh, the frequency uh, domain, but I'll I'll have to uh, go back and look at that uh, study that was done. Maybe okay. I can take that offline with you. I so, yes, I, I yeah, need to have uh, a quick. This is a very important topic right now. We are addressing a very important topic, which is the size the size demand for atomic clocks. So I I, I have called Quanta in the room and I went to to see their their location last week and I saw their their new product and I saw how small this is getting. But of course, without your uh, wish list, it is impossible to to really define what the atomic clock companies have to develop. So. How small is small? And I know you told, you told already about the chip level and don't say as small as it can be, that's cheating. But how small is small? What would be the, the right format, the right form factor of an atomic clock system? Yeah, um, well, the, 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 the atomic clock itself right now is, you know, one by one kind of, uh, one inch by one inch kind of, uh, size, I, I, I yeah. you know, that, that is acceptable at the moment. It's really more, um, the, the power and stability, um, and cost that, um, that we would like to see, uh, improved. So, um, um, because the handheld tester has the volume to be able to, you know, have a, a chip on it or a small module on it. That's not the issue. It's really, um, uh, you know, more of the stability, getting to the next generation uh, from what we kind of observe of, you know, a couple E to the minus 11th due to the environmental factors to have that move down to one E to the minus uh, 12, um, you kind of under those same conditions would be what we'd like to see. I am very interested in the opinions here from Leonardo and from the Air Force as well. We have uh, Boyan Tabakov in the room, but we'll come back to you later. But this is after the presentation from Orolia. I would like to discuss this because this is one of the key challenges you can solve with the current companies here. Sana, let's go, let's go to the Orolia success story okay. of the meeting. Yeah. And let's go back then afterwards to, to Biavi and let's go back later to Quantum Valley Ideas Lab and many photonics and see how we can build another nice project together like the one we built in the beginning. So introduce, because I know you were really hard on the next presentation, introduce Aurolia, you are desperate for that. Yes, so Aurolia, we want to hear about this uh, Atom on chip and this big collaboration that you're doing with the CSEM. Aurolia, have the spectra time. Huh? So uh, we start. Christian? Oh. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, just want to... Do you see uh, my screen? Yeah, just uh, go to the presenter mode and yes. you can just start. So this talk will be shared uh, between uh, Aurolia and uh, CSEM as they work together on the project. Okay, great. Thanks, Asana. Uh, so um, hello, everyone. Um, I will start out uh, a short five slides on, on Aurolia, uh, the company and the, our product portfolio. And I think I can answer some of these uh, questions by uh, Jose and uh, relating to uh, Viavi and uh, Ericsson, some of a uh, very recent product we introduced uh, last uh, summer 2020. And then uh, Jacques Esler from CSCM will continue and uh, talk a little bit of, about CFCM, of course, and our collaboration uh, between Aurolia and CSCM. So Aurolia is uh, celebrating now its 15th year uh, anniversary. 
we started out at a few companies, so Switzerland, France, and the US uh, 15 years ago, and we've grown to a 100 million euro um, business now. We are worldwide, and uh, we, we consider ourselves world, leader, world leaders in uh, resilient uh, PNT, positioning, navigation, and uh, timing. So um, our, our solutions uh, focus a lot on um, providing uh, uh, resilient PNT. So we, we do not only provide uh, you with a PNT solution, we also look at uh, and validate the signal and provide you a mitigation strategy in case um, uh, you are a, a, a victim of uh, jamming or spoofing. So this is our really our core business, resilient PNT. Uh, we are serving different uh, industries ranging from uh, the timing and synchronization uh, uh, market, uh, defense avionics, telecom, mobile systems, of course, and um, in science and meteorology for, for example, very large uh, base interferometers uh, for geodetic systems and, and uh, timekeeping for um, GNS systems, for example, Galileo. Uh, we provide also the clocks for the uh, uh, Galileo time, the ground system uh, time. Uh, scale uh, and uh, one of our uh, really uh, core business is, uh, is also, also um, atomic clock for space, which I will mention a little bit on the next uh, slides. So uh, I, I now uh, zoom in on uh, on uh, a part of Aurolia, that's Aurolia Switzerland, uh, and our atomic clock portfolio. Um, what you see here is, um, if I just take a style, uh, we have five. Uh, 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 product groups. Uh, on the left, uh, the first two columns is um, ground-based uh, rubidium clocks. Uh, we use uh, plasma uh, lamps in um, a lot of our, uh, most of our rubidium uh, uh, products, uh, but we have recently introduced a, um, a new miniature uh, rubidium clock using uh, laser technology, uh, Vixel uh, vertical cavity surface emitting laser. So um, that's, that's a, a, a certainly a discussing point with if somebody wants to discuss uh, this, is we're very interested in that. Um, we roughly have produced uh, a, a 50, uh, 65,000 of these uh, clocks for ground. And um, they, are, they come in uh, the second uh, portfolio uh, the group here, they come in synch synchronized versions. Uh, so they can of course be synchronized to a GNS uh, signal. Uh, in the uh, in the third portfolio group here, uh, you see uh, our uh, called iSpace. You see our um, atomic clocks for, and uh, uh, quartz oscillators for space. So um, we have currently uh, delivered more than 200 uh, flight models uh, of of uh, ultra stable uh, quartz oscillators. And uh, currently, we have delivered more than 150, uh, 164, uh, to be precise, space atomic clocks. And we have um, uh, the RAFs, the Rubidium Atomic uh, Frequency Standard, which is uh, uh, fabricated directly in, in our site, uh, Oronia, Switzerland. And together with uh, Leonardo, which is also present today, we provide the physics package uh, for the uh, passive hydrogen maser. Uh, both of these clocks, the RAFs and the, the, the PHM, uh, are flying on, on the Galileo, uh, the first generation. And uh, together with Leonardo, we uh, we had uh, just uh, in May signed the contract with uh, the European Union and ESA to provide, um, I think, uh, 68 clocks for um, second generation uh, uh, satellites. So it's a, it's a huge contract uh, that we uh, we're, are working uh, hard on at the moment. Just a few words on the, on the, on the, on the systems uh, part of the portfolio. We have uh, a lot of, we're coming back to ground-based clocks, uh, synchronized rubidium clocks. And in particular, uh, we have uh, T for science, uh, now a part of, uh, of the Aurelia group, um, uh, building uh, more like refrigerator sized active hydrogen masers, which are really ultra stable atomic clocks, which provide uh, very stable, ultra stable uh, signals for, uh, VLPI, this uh, this very long baseline interferometry, to de to uh, to determine the movement on continents or uh, for astronomy, and uh, as I mentioned before, these active hydrogen masers are also used uh, to provide the Galileo um, uh, clock uh, time. That's the time that they used to synchronize all the satellite clocks. So that ultra precise time is actually derived from uh, from these active hydrogen masers, combined of course with the, with cesium clocks also. 
Um, and now I, I just I was highlight here uh, the, the newest uh, member of our rubidium clock portfolio is the uh, uh, MRO50, uh, the miniaturized rubidium oscillator, which is a very low uh, uh, swap uh, oscillator. Swap is size, weight, and power consumption. So let me go a little bit into uh, to the details of, of this clock. Uh, it's based on our heritage uh, rubidium clocks, uh, which are, are plasma pumped uh, optical clocks, but it has been reduced in power by using uh, Vixel lasers and reducing the size of the, of the uh, uh, rubidium vapor cell inside. The footprint you see on the left here is uh, roughly 51 by 51 by 20 millimeters, giving a volume of roughly 51 cubic centimeters. And it has a pinout, uh, which is a uh, one-to-one uh, -one compatible with the uh, OCXO uh, oscillators, but um, it is, 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 is much uh, higher performing than, than, than uh, typical commercial OCXOs. Um, so it's a really a drop-in replacement solution for, for any system engineer who wants to replace an OCXO with, uh, with the SpectroTime MRO50. It has uh, aging, um, which is uh, um, specified at less than 5 10 to minus 12 per day, which is a, a, few, a few orders of magnitude better than OCXOs. And uh, it also has a much better um, temperature uh, performance. So over a temperature range from minus 10 to 65, it only has a, a 4 10 to minus 10 uh, variation. And we have worked hard to reduce the power consumption. So you have a, a, a clock which has a power consumption of roughly uh, uh, three to 400 milliwatts uh, at room temperature. And that's again, uh, up to five, uh, five times better than the OCXO. So uh, just to mention, uh, coming back to the uh, talk of uh, Ericsson and uh, Viavi, uh, uh, Stefano and uh, Dave, uh, the, this, this new product from, from uh, Orolia, uh, it has, uh, at one second, it has a stability of uh, 14 to minus 11, going down to roughly a 10 minus 12, uh, several few 10 to minus 12 uh, at one day. We've measured the uh, the holdover time uh, performance, so we are roughly at uh, in in a quite uh, uh, stable uh, temperature environment. We are roughly at a few hundred nanoseconds uh, holdover time at at one day. So this this replies to this uh, how how easy is it to keep one second over let's say one day or a few days uh, one excuse me one microsecond over a few a few days. So the MRO50 would be able to keep uh, in a stable environment such as uh, used uh, in in. Uh, by Ericsson uh, network distribution, we will be able to keep this one microsecond over, over several days uh, with an MRO50. Of course, in the case of distributed, uh, this field measurements that they've mentioned uh, via, for, for BIV, uh, we would have to discuss offline and look a little bit at the, the temp, Tempco, and, uh, et cetera. But of course we have do, done magnetic shielding for, for uh, vibration stability, uh, temperature isolation. So, so uh, it, it would maybe be able to keep also for a measurement duration of say half an hour, one hour, I think the MRO50 might be applicable to, uh, to, um, to uh, VAV. And I would like at this point to men mention that uh, the MRO, Actually, we, we use some more heritage technology. We use a glass blown waiver cell to get better stability than, than the, than the, the so-called chip scale atomic clock. But still, we managed to get this better stability in a form factor that is as small as a chip scale atomic clock and has a power consumption very close to a chip scale atomic clock. So uh, I think with this, with my last slide, and uh, I will give the word to uh, Jacques Kessler from CCM. I think you no, I, I, I'm sorry, Shaq. I forgot uh, this <laughs> time cut. Uh, just, just so I will very uh, uh, fast because I've, I've spent a lot of time. This uh, actually uh, division in France, uh, O2S uh, Aurelia uh, System Solutions. This uh, uh, time cut we call it Art Atomic Reference Time. Yeah, on the link that is shown in, in uh, on this slide, uh, so you can learn about that's actually for, uh, for example, uh, open compute uh, server architecture. So you can, based on this card, build a PTP uh, Grandmaster. Okay. So with that last slide, uh, I will give you the word to Shaq. Thanks. Yeah, I will ask you to advance the slides. So it's a honor for us to, to work with Aurolia, the, the leader of, of in atomic clock uh, uh, market. So CSEM is a research and technology organization working in different fields. So you see here precision manufacturing, digitalization, and sustainable energy, we try to help and to work with the industry to bring new market, new product on the market. You can go ahead. So let's go, let's speak about what we can offer. So one of the main things we developed in the last year were atomic vapor cell. You can also go forward. Uh, 
So we fabricate them at the wafer level, and this is the core of the atomic clocks uh, and the chip scale atomic clocks. And uh, the performance that were mentioned by Christian just before with glass cells, we tried to achieve the same performance or similar performance with MEMS atomic vapor cells, thanks to patented rubidium azide filling, uh, protective coatings, and also a patent gold micro disc, which allowed to to have the rubidium where we want and not at the middle of the of the cell. You can go forward. What we we measured, uh, can, yeah, what we measured with Spectata and with Aurolia are the frequency drift of this vapor cell, MEMS vapor cell, compared to glass vapor cells, and we achieved very similar results. You see, heat drift performances down to one to ten to the minus twelve in about for for two of the cells that we have integrated in atomic clocks from Aurolia. One is uh, performing a little bit less, but with time, the, the performance are increasing. And after three months, they are all in specification. And we are calling uh, all performance leading uh, uh, performances. So you can go forward, Christian. Now what we can offer also is to make out of this uh, uh, vapor cell a physics package that can be used in atomic clocks. So let's go forward. And here I take the same table that was used by, by Spectra time. So here you see the, our atomic uh, physics package. That the size is 20 by 15 by five millimeters. So it's a, a volume of 1.C cubic centimeter. The average uh, power consumption of this physics package is uh, 50 watts maximum among, among the temperature range. Uh, the short-term stability that you can achieve with such uh, a physics package is down to 8, 10 to the minus 11. So it's really good for a cheap scale atomic clock. And the real advantage of that physics package is the height. So we have a height which is less than 5 millimeter that you can then package in something which is very short. Just go ahead. Uh, and now what we try to do with, uh, with Spectra Time, with Aurolia, is to merge their expertise and ours. So taking the MRO50 as a, as a baseline, trying to integrate our physics package to modify it so it's near to commercial application. You see the picture in the middle, how it looks like. And you see on the top uh, how we achieve very uh, small footprint and very small height. This uh, waveguide we, you see with the colors, uh, with in-coupling and out-coupling gratings, allow us to make uh, a physics package which is compatible with uh, the MRO50. And we are looking forward to, to have this physics package integrated, we made first measurements, which con confirm uh, what we were willing to achieve. So the performance at short term are, as we expected, 8, 10 to the minus 11 and one second, power consumption very low, and we hope to get uh, a product with Spectra Time with a power consumption of about 150 watts uh, at 5 volt, which is something similar to the CSAC from Microsemi. And a uh, very last slide uh, of the next generation of atomic clocks. So we are also working on optic, optical atomic clocks uh, very briefly. So you, you lock a laser on an atomic transition, continuous wave laser, and then you lock this laser to a comb and you use the comb to down convert the, the optical frequency to usable frequency in the, uh, in the microwave domain. And with this, you, you get a bit, much better stability. For the time being, the size is not uh, the, the same one that we get with microwave atomic clocks, but still the performance are, are really good down to 10 to the minus 13 that you can see here. And we expect to be able to miniaturize that further in the future, uh, in the next future years. So this would be uh, the end of my talk and sure we are happy to answer some questions. Uh, Jacques, what atom is this? Uh, I, I never remember the wavelengths. <laughs> <laughs> so it, we always it's use uh, rubidium. No. It's rubidium. rubidium. Okay. Yeah, both in the microwave and on the, the optical clock here. No. Uh, thank you so much for this very nice clock. And uh, uh, we will get a, a question from, uh, from Nanoplast, from NARS. Uh, before that, let me ask you the EPIC question. Now you showed this uh, nice setups. You know how EPIC goes, right? You'd say yeah, what, sure. you, what you can do, and you have to give us some challenges uh, to build a supply chain. So uh, what does it take to have... Uh, uh, to, uh, to, to scale up this kind of technology and have it commercialized? And what challenges can you offer here? 
Yeah, I think I had some questions. So the, the packaging and the vacuum encapsulation is always one of the, the key points. And uh, we heard from Fraunhofer at the beginning, this glass uh, uh, top covering. And I had some question how the ceiling is done uh, with this glass cap, because this might be interesting because we have optical components and laser and photodiodes, which cannot sustain very high temperature. So for the ceiling, it's quite important to, to see what, what's feasible by the others. We still have Thomas in the room. Maybe Thomas, you can answer him directly. Yeah, of course. So this uh, is done by a reflow technique. So we use uh, this uh, amorphous glass and um, on several areas, we put uh, the silicon with this higher uh, temperature melting and, and together with a certain vacuum adjustments and so on, we can, we can um, adjust these tilted surfaces also or bubbles or something like that. But the temperature is uh, of which order? Temperature is the melting point of quartz glass. So, I ah, so it's very high temperature. Yeah, yeah it's very high. Okay. So, but, but I've seen in, in your examples, you had some components inside. So, mm -hmm. do they sustain the temperature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Okay. <laughs> We'd be happy to, to speak some, with some more details about that with you. Yeah. You can always, you can always add a, a exchange contact uh, in the chat channel, which is really good for the people in the Zoom room. Uh, or also you can write an email directly to me or to Jose, and we can do the introductions for you, especially sure. to EPIC members, of course. Uh, we, uh, Lars, what do you have in mind? Yeah, um, thank you, Sana. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you very much, Christian and, and Jackson, and uh, Jack also, uh, the other talks for being open what, what market size is. Um, we do semiconductor lasers and uh, nobody, uh, we, we can tailor our wavelength to almost everywhere you like, but it's quite expensive to do that, right? So we, I talk a lot to people who say, okay, I have, I have this great idea and then they want 10,000 lasers and we cannot laser, tailor a laser for, for, for 10,000 parts, right? The, the chip would still cost 150 euro in that case. So um, this, this, what is it, CMRO50 with the, with the Vixel laser, um, I, I guess it's not a tailored Vixel laser, it's just a standard Vixel laser. But what, um, what volume do you have in mind? What applications? Well, uh, as I mentioned, this is a, this is a product that, that, that we put on the market last year. So uh, we see a, a very high interest in, in the product. Um, I would say that, uh, yeah, you would have to wait a few years to, to go up uh, in, in the 10 thousands of, uh, of, of, of units uh, per year. So, so I think we need an offline discussion about what, what could be the, uh, the market uh, long term. But I, I think there is a really uh, a gross potential uh, for, for these miniature atomic clocks uh, as they get smaller. And also they are quite, uh, I mean, uh, cost, uh, cost effective. I mean, that, uh, and, and, and the one key point is exactly as you mentioned, it's, uh, it's the unit price per, for, for example, for one of the, the main components, the, the, the laser. Uh, and and that's of course is tied to the to the uh, to the market uh, how many how, how many units uh, we we can make. So uh, yeah, we, we need an offline discussion about about uh, about that. Uh, but very interesting. Do you do you make uh, uh, last? Do you make um, uh, Vixas also, uh, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, or only uh, edge emitting? Uh, we we are specialized really in edge emittings. We okay. I think we could also do vertical um, uh, Vixels. Yeah. Yeah, um, because one, one developing of the that is even more expensive, right? <laughs> right, right. So. <laughs> but it's it's really a, it's really a breakthrough technology for, for atomic clocks in this in, in, in terms of the very low uh, threshold uh, current. So we I mean we use what, what to, is what is I mean we, we could do we, pixel like edge emitters. So do you yeah. do you want the the, the, the power um, consumption the would be would keep, the, the power consumption would be uh, the key key point. I, I just want to mention a few numbers. We we used the uh, rubidium plasma lamps which were a few watts of power consumption. With a Vixel, typical uh, we uh, cut uh, uh, component Vixel, we are down at a few milliwatts of uh, power consumption. We only need a roughly 100 microwatts, 200 microwatts of output power. So that's why that that's that's the technology that is mostly used. I mean, also by by all uh, different different competitors in 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 the, in the business. Christian, we still have uh, other members, uh, of course. Uh, we can help you with these interjections. We have uh, IQE here in the room, but we also have a bandwidth 10 and uh, uh, Nano Plus, of course, and uh, we can have a longer discussion about this uh, later. But uh, there's a discussion that Jose has in mind, and I know that he has something to uh, he would like to share. 
Thank you very much for that, Sana. Uh, it is, uh, there is still one thing that I want to address, but of course, when I have Ivan Davis with the hand up, this is the key oh, company oh, developing sorry. wafers for big cells in the world. So Ivan, what's on your mind? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, yeah, I was going to, uh, to talking about pixels for atomic clocks. I was going to share with you one slide, if I could. Yes, of um, course. And I must say that at this moment, Epic is preparing, just please start sharing the slide. Epic is preparing a market report on pixels, which will be released in the coming month. And there we have atomic clocks as an interesting market segment for pixels. So Epic members will receive this exclusive market intelligence from Tracy Vanik. Ivan, yes, please share. And if anybody knows me, they know how much I love pixels. <laughs> so I hope you can all see this. So this is um, a very brief. Um, IQE is involved with uh, uh, UK National Foundry for Quantum Photonics Components. This is supported in the UK by our national funding agency. Uh, and we have another partner here in the form of NPL with Dan. Um, you can see all the all the uh, companies and universities that are involved in this, and the target here is to manufacture com quantum photonic components um, and look at their manufacturability, reliability, and um, build supply chains. So, uh, the supply chains we are involved with in this uh, in this consortium are in quantum communications, quantum computing, magnetometry, quantum sensing, and relevant to this discussion, atomic clocks. Um, so uh, the atomic clocks, we are um, working on VIXELs, uh, narrow line width, high stability VIXELs, and uh, specifically in one project, looking at uh, compact uh, cesium atomic clocks with, with the fractional stability below 10 to the minus 12, as we've already heard in the, in the discussion today. So we're looking at 894 nanometer VIXELs. Uh, with high uniformity, of course, we talked just now about the yield and the cost of these uh, of these uh, surface emitting lasers. So we're looking at less than three nanometer wavelength tolerance on on a large wafer. Um, so we have a suite of proprietary laser designs and simulation models, uh, and novel VIXEL characterization processes for quantum, and that that is essentially in in conjunction with NPL. Uh, and well, we're making polarization insensitive single mode VIXELs. Uh, with, with very high performance. So uh, what we can do for any of you is if you can get in touch with us, uh, there's a link down the bottom there. Um, and we uh, aim ultimately after this project is completed to have an open access foundry for quantum photonic components um, where we can tailor the needs of the, of the user. Okay, thanks. You know, when, when IQE, IQE focuses always on the large volumes, Lars from Nanoplast, this is uh, regarding your comment. I keep focusing on the large volumes. When they are developing wafer based manufacturing of big cells at 894 nanometers with accuracies of three nanometers, there you get the market demand. Yeah, you, know. you get the market. It, it, no matter which market report you will check, it will not get any better than what you just heard. <laughs> well, you know, you, you are you are finding the yields maybe even on a six inch wafer with that accuracy, maybe not 100 percent of the wafer, but certainly, you know, half the wafer within that within that tolerance, so very, very tight tolerance, as you know, is 894.6 nanometers ID for cesium. 894.6 nanometer big cells growing at IQE, and that's a huge development for the atomic clock industry. Before I go to the last speaker today, which we saved one of the best for the last, we said the UK Metrology Center MPL. Before I go there, there are two people in the room that I want to now go to say hello to and get from them what is their current interest and challenges in this field. We're going first to Leonardo and then to the US Air Force. Oh, wow. Eh? Leonardo, Roberto Fabric, grazie mille for being with us today. You heard a lot about what is happening right now. The trend is obviously miniaturization. The trend is obviously removing RF and going to photonics for that miniaturization. And the trend is to develop very specific lasers for this to happen. Roberto, what's on your mind? Hi there. I mean, first, thanks for for this opportunity and uh, uh, first of all I, I feel like quite obsolete because actually I'm an RF system engineer so I'm not dealing very well with photonics but uh, I mean <laughs> I know that uh, it's the next frontier photonics are uh, atomic clocks uh, photonic pump uh, atomic clocks um, actually uh, Leonardo already developed uh, 
together with Aurelia yeah, Spectrotime, uh, probably the best uh, passive hydrogen maser for uh, space applications uh, for the Galileo satellite projects. Um, it's a standard maser, hydrogen maser is nothing, let's say, brand new, of course, or revolutionary. Um, uh, but uh, of course, uh, when you are dealing with space uh, in the space segment, of course, uh, there is a lot of more re restrictive requirements uh, and uh, let's say, uh, let's say um, targets that need to be fulfilled completely. First, and the first, of course, is the uh, reliability of the system because nobody can fix a satellite after it has been launched. And uh, so this actually, uh, I mean, I feel like a, 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 an old uh, 4T in a way because I mean, our PHM is uh, quite, quite big and heavy in comparison to this uh, extraordinary example of uh, uh, nanophotonic uh, circuits. Um, and despite this, uh, as uh, um, Christian already from Rolly at all does, uh, we, have, we have a new contract with uh, the European um, um, uh, Union for see, together, of course, with uh, ESA to, for um, 60 new uh, uh, atomic clocks for, mm -hmm. new, just, um, for new satellites. And of course, we are uh, pushing as much as possible in, uh, to, to reduce mass and uh, of course, uh, volume of our atomic clock, because uh, uh, it's maybe it's trivial, but of course, uh, less is better in space segment because it's uh, it reduced the cost for the launch in first place. Of course, uh, hydrogen has some limitation uh, or uh, Christian know this very well, because I mean, the resonant cavity has, needs to fulfill specific dimensions and uh, let's say, um, uh, specific uh, uh, requirements cannot be, let's say, shrinked more than this. Um, probably, uh, I, my guess is that in the next years we are going to see probably new um, atomic clocks, probably based on rubidium, gas rubidium, optical pumped. Uh, if, of course, uh, and this will require that all the production process. Uh, and technology need to be uh, space uh, need to fulfill the space requirements. This is another goal. Maybe I know it's a more let's say uh, a small market in comparison to the large volume we were mentioned before. And um, um, so uh, we are still very interested to to improve to keep the same at least the same performances of our clock and reduce its mass and volume. Um, I'm still quite. I mean, see, even if the, the the Galileo project is already in, in place uh, since more than 20 years. Uh, it's still uh, quite, re I'm quite, uh, I was impressed the first time I arrived here about the, the performances of um, uh, um, Galileo PHM clock for uh, an Allen deviation uh, short time of uh, minus, so uh, magnitude of order that's 10 at minus 13, minus 14. So actually we can perform better than a standard, of course, uh, let's say, in, uh, hydrogen clock, a passive, a passive, of course, hydrogen clock uh, in, for, for the space application. Um, some people ask me, why don't you use an active maser? Uh, yeah. for the, uh, it's too heavy and too big. <laughs> there is no way. And uh, they were, what was the first time I asked when I joined uh, Leonardo Group? And they say, it's too heavy. There is no way they're going to place you know what, Roberto? One thing that is happening right now in the synchronization network Maybe is that we are system. we are bringing uh, ultra fast um, lasers. I, I'm one thing that is happening right now, Roberto, in this network is that we are actually bringing ultra fast lasers to to do a huge level synchronization. I have one of the world success stories on that in the room. Menir Photonics, all the way from Switzerland, developing femtosecond laser, ultra fast laser from synchronization, is represented today by Florian, the CEO, and Edgar, the director of Menir Photonics. Good afternoon. Hello. 
before we prepare this call, I'm going to go first to Boyan Tabakov. He's our main contact at the U.S. Air Force. We have been discussing with him many challenges for the U.S. Air Force. He's been always very open to start new operations. Boyan, first of all, thank you very much for following up with the something like 10 introductions we already made to you for business development. Thank you very much for that. Boyan, uh, after this meeting, during this meeting, we heard a lot about new add-ons. We heard about miniaturization. What's on your mind? How do you see this market of atomic clocks? Thank you, sir, for having me here. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you, sir. So, um, well, I don't have much to contribute to this uh, conversation because I, as you remember, um, lead an, a basic research program in atomic and molecular physics. It is always fascinating to see the endpoint uh, of, of where this basic research eventually goes and uh, how uh, those technologies mature, what we conceive in the lab or in theory eventually matures to those products that um, spill into uh, improving our everyday life. So um, it is a, a fascinating uh, thing to observe uh, and the, the wealth of ideas that are being um, realized here in this meeting is uh, rather fascinating. So thank you for this opportunity. And now that I, oh Boyan, you are open for new cooperations, listen to this one. We have in the room one of the key companies in femtosecond laser manufacturing for network synchronization. Coming all the way from Switzerland, my very good friend and CEO of Menil Photonics, Florian. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jose, for the introduction. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, as Jose said, um, I think we are a bit on the extremely high precision of what is being discussed today. And I think there's also our partners in Germany, Cycles, which is in the room. Um, to make it short, what we do here at Penic Photonic is be able to, with pulse laser, optical pulse laser, to distribute over hundreds of meters or kilometers long uh, time and frequency and to create synchronization signals with tens of femtoseconds or better of synchronizations. So that's really on the high end of the whole timing and synchronization needed for particle accelerator telescope and many of the high end application. But we are maturing the processes and the system to bring it to more industry and uh, easier system to be using. I would like very much that this becomes a project with the US Air Force. The Boyan <laughs> actually shows this as a, as a possible room for cooperation in the fast. So I would like the two of you to get introduced. And now with everybody introducing the room, almost all of you already told me by now they have found at least one follow-up discussion room for business. This is great. We go to the UK Metrology Center, MPL to close the circle. Thank you very much, Dean, for being with us today. Tell us, tell us how we can help you be even more accurate than you already are. The floor is yours. Dan is with us. Dan Bill, can we hear you? Can we see you? I love when we are so sharp in time, five o'clock or last speaker goes there. Dan, the floor is yours. There we go. Can you see my screen? Gorilla glass clear. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jose. So um, I, so PTB is a very similar institute to MPL. So, uh, but I, I'm, I pitched my talk a bit differently. So I'm going to be a little bit more, more high level than they were. So just a quick intro. So um, we are the UK's National Metrology Institute. So again, similar to PTB and NIST, we hold the standards for the UK. We have a load of, of measurement scientists, but specifically in the area of time, frequency, and quantum, we're extremely strong. Um, you know, the UK in general has invested about a billion pounds into the UK's quantum uh, program. And, uh, you know, so we are, are heavily involved in that because it's such a big area for metrology. I want to do a, a slight digression at the beginning because one of the reasons where any of us are here uh, is because uh, at MPL, we're quite proud of our history. Um, the atomic clock, or the first usable atomic clock, was invented at MPL in, in 1955 by Louis Essen. And I think um, it's quite an interesting uh, tale of, of how, um, so in the quantum field and time and frequency, you get these disciplines that come together. Um, so the, the reason he actually invented the clock was he, he first started at MPL early 1900s. Um, he started working on some crystal oscillators. Um, he then went on to do some speed of light measurements, as you do for good physicists around that time, which was kind of in the 20s, 30s. 
Uh, World War II came along, and so um, radar was being developed at that time, and MPL was also key to, to radar. Uh, um, and he started working on high-frequency radar and built some cavity resonance wave meters. When the war ended, he kind of put all these together and out popped, you know, as it were, uh, this, this atomic clock, basically using all these disciplines together he'd learned over many years, uh, trying to tackle this problem. And, uh, you know, there was, uh, NIST was involved at the time as well, and, and named differently, um, where they, they sort of figured that atomic transitions and the emissions from atoms were potentially a really good way to get more accurate clocks. So I apologize for the, the, the slight digression, but I just thought it was really interesting context uh, to, to just show the richness of, of the physics of the things that we're all trying to tackle here. So uh, MPL, uh, again, I've pitched this very, very high level. Uh, I'll just show you a few things we're, uh, that we're, we're really key with at the moment. So in the UK, um, we're leading a 36 million pound program called the National Timing Center Program, um, which is, is focused on basically building a, a network of atomic clock clusters, which will be meshed together to effectively overhaul our national time scale. Uh, we're also giving out funding for uh, most of the UK companies uh, through innovation, time and frequency. And then we're looking at skills as well. Uh, and I'll also sort of mention it at the end, but we're, we're putting together some online e-learning modules, the first of which will be free, which is called Introduction Time and Frequency. Um, so there are a few things that come in this program that I'll be passing back to Jose, I'm sure, uh, at the time, but uh, it might be interesting for the, this audience. Um, right in the middle is, is a key role we have, and the reason that we were able to win this National Timing Center program is, is we realize the time scale uh, in the UK. Uh, so we have all of the, the highly accurate clocks and season fountain frequency references you might imagine um, that places like PTB and NIST do as well. Uh, but this really puts us in a, a unique sort of neutral position, uh, which means we don't uh, favor any particular industry or, uh, or company, and we're able to be um, sort of collaborative with a lot of uh, international players as well. So we're, we, we can bring a lot of uh, different things that um, you know, companies uh, inherently um, work slightly differently. And then last bit on the right is, is we're quite involved in, as I mentioned, UK's quantum program. Uh, we've got commercialization activities. So in that picture on the bottom right, just an example of some testing on something called the MINAC, interatomic clock that we're developing with E2V. So it just gives you a bit of a, a overview of what we do. Um, what we offer, I'm, I'm sticking very strictly to the, the three slide limit here. Um, so on the left hand side, underpinning uh, clock technologies, again, some of so the similar things that, that PTB mentioned are, are things that we work on as well. I just thought that quite an interesting graphic on, on the bottom left. So that's um, from a, um, a UK program that we also have international connections with, which is using a network of atomic clocks to look at um, the, the sort of fundamental uh, constants of nature in the standard model. Um, so again, it's just a, just a bit of a graphic, but it, it just shows you some of the really near-term, super interesting applications that you can get when you place great atomic clocks in locations and network them together, which is exactly what we're doing with the National Timing Center program and exactly what um, industries like telecoms are doing to try to underpin timing of their networks. So it just gives you a bit of a flavor of, um, apart from the, the really end users, um, what the sort of national infrastructure needs are. Uh, we also provide funding. Um, we, again, sorry, uh, uh, European folks, but uh, a lot of it is to the UK because it comes from UK government. But uh, we, we just came out, had a competition early this year for invasion time and frequency where that was two million pounds. We're putting another four million pounds out to industry uh, next year. So any UK industry companies, um, you know, contact me if you're not aware of that. Um, and then, again, as mentioned, a lot of international collaborations on the bottom right, again, PTB uh, being here today, uh, one of the, the projects we work on is looking at uh, you know, distributed atomic clock networks um, at the sort of NMI level. Uh, also interesting, that the top picture there, square kilometer array, um, NPL was involved in designing the time scale, and there are a number of companies uh, in this call who are uh, quite keen, as we are, to contribute to this, the build phase of the square kilometer array, which needs clusters of, of masers and time distribution equipment. Um, so that's uh, going to be a facility active for the next 50 years. That is, again, a kind of a driver of, of technology and, and needs, not at high volume by any means, but uh, it's really, really fascinating applications that the whole supply chain of photonics, quantum, et cetera, can really contribute to. Um, and then very lastly, uh, my attempt to answer your question about what we're looking for, what sort of challenges. So 
three things. So one, which has been mentioned a couple of times, uh, I respond to a couple of presentations in, in Aurolia, for example, this idea of resilient position navigation timing, um, which need, have requirements in supply chain uh, in terms of resilience of components, but also how they're used, how they're integrated into, for example, telecoms networks or the electricity grid. So what we're finding is that well, we operate in a, a really um, a domain of quite high accuracy as a, as a National Metrology Institute and realizing a timescale for the UK. Um, resilience is actually what government cares about and is much higher on the government agenda. And it's what things like critical national infrastructure of telecom systems, the energy grid, uh, transport systems, the finance sector, et cetera, that's what they really care about. Um, so obviously, on a technical level, that feeds in certain technologies, but the, the actual output um, is, is resilience. Um, I'll be very quick here to finish up. Uh, user needs, uh, we're always interested in knowing what do you need, um, and specifically that's around standards, test and evaluation capability facilities. What can government bodies like MPL or PTP do to better support the quantum photonics industry to develop your next generation talks, et cetera? And then I won't go into it, but I've already mentioned it. We also desperately would like next to energy clocks. What's going to replace the mazes and cesium clocks of today? Uh, where the optical technologies are going up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this. Uh, also for all of you for a fantastic meeting with lots of discussion. It is nine minutes after five, so I would like to apologize for everybody who said, okay, nine minutes is too much. For me, it was totally worth it. Totally worth it because in two hours and nine minutes, we actually summarize some of the key challenges on this industry. First, the main trend, clock on achieve. And there it was very clearly specified by PTV and now by MPL, by many of the packaging companies, there is great room for cooperation here on optical switches, on the pure RF frequency generation generation and their microwave photonics is very, very, very important. We're organizing a meeting on microwave photonics in the coming month. Pay special attention to that. And the low insertion loss is still a key challenge that will be addressed by the companies in the room. The main point of discussion today was rubidium versus cesium. And as a photonic, as an optical person, I love rubidium very, very much, but I have to say that still, in terms of size and payload reduction, it looks like rubidium from what we heard from the integrators is the way to go in terms of accuracy and Instead of price, there are still very well supporters of the CCU, and that still is the main challenge here to decide to one or the other. Great momentum, Aurelia, congratulations on the Galileo 2 second generation system. You landed the biggest at contract, the biggest contract in the history of atomic clocks in Europe with ESA with Thales and Leonardo as partners. And the biggest development, IQE has now a big cell line fully dedicated to atomic clocks, 42.6 nanometer with three nanometer accuracy level in the wafer. Those great room for cooperation to work together. This is what this meeting is about. This great discussion in two hours and nine minutes. We try to make it as concise as we could. Thank you very much for another epic afternoon. And that concludes the public part of today's meeting. If you are in our Zoom room, or informal private discussion is about to start. I call it virtual drinks with friends. And we all know follow-up is important. But for now, if you are watching on YouTube, that's where we leave you for today. Thanks to the Epic Production crew and all the sponsors for making today's event possible. More details about upcoming meetings are on our website. And if you want to get in touch with any of the participants, all you have to do is contact